Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Now, recently we checked out Battlefield 5 GPU performance uh, using a massive range of graphics cards at 1080p, 1440p and 4K. For that test, we used the single player campaign uh, as it's just a quick and easy way to accurately record the data we needed. And visually, the single and multiplayer portions of the game are much the same. However, there is a big difference when it comes to the demand on the CPU uh, between single and multiplayer, uh, particularly when using the 64 player multiplayer modes that puts the hurt on lower end processors. So for this CPU performance video, we will be using a 64 player mode. We'll be playing uh, in the conquest maps. This creates a few challenges for testing. Firstly, the fluctuation between runs can be quite large. A Battlefield 5 single player benchmark often delivers the same average frame rate over and over again, and the same is also true for the 1% low result. With high-end hardware, a deviation of more than a few frames is quite rare. Testing with multiplayer though, I did sometimes see up to a 10 FPS difference for the average frame rate. Having said that, I did neglect any extreme outliers, and I tested many more times than I normally would to try and report the most accurate performance I could. So the results are based on an average of six runs rather than three. Because of this, I feel watching gameplay footage of two different harbour configurations executing a similar pass uh, side by side is next to useless, so I won't be doing any of that. For example, if you've got 30 players relatively close, uh, all engaging in battle, the frame rates will be much lower than if the action was taking place off in the distance and you were perhaps off by yourself. So making sure the same sort of stuff is going on around the player character for each pass was a serious challenge and extremely time consuming. For testing, I'm using the Narvik map in the 64 player conquest mode. The test runs for 60 seconds and I'm reporting the average frame rate along with the 1% low frame time result. Again, the results are based on an average of at least six runs and any extreme outliers were removed. Okay, so let's get in the results. For most of this testing, I'll be using DirectX 11 as it provides more consistent frame time performance. I know plenty of you are claiming that DirectX 12 is now fixed and is better than DirectX 11. But unless you're using a really low-end CPU, uh, DirectX 11 does offer a better experience. Anyway, here are the DirectX 12 numbers for those of you interested. I'm not going to discuss these results as my focus will be on the slightly better performing DirectX 11. So if you want to study these figures for yourself, uh, feel free to pause the video now. Okay, so here are all the CPUs retested using the DirectX 11 API. And as you can see, Ryzen cops a bit of a pounding under these conditions. The Core i5-8400 is roughly on par with the Ryzen 7 2700X, while the older 7700K is faster. Beyond that, we see processors such as the 8600K, 8700K, 9600K, and so on, all easily beating the best AMD has to offer. Still with well over 60 FPS at all times, Ryzen did provide smooth, perfectly playable performance, and I'll move on to some more favorable testing in a moment. It's really interesting to see the once mighty Core i5 7600K really struggling, and it's easily done in by the Ryzen 5 2600X. In fact, the Ryzen 5 2400G was comparable to the 7600K, and that's not something we often see, if ever. Then we see the Ryzen 3 2200G comfortably beating the Core i3 7350K and Pentium G5400. Basically anything dual core is gonna get destroyed by the quad core 2200G, uh, even if they have hyper threading, for example. So a decent showing from AMD at the low end, but not great for the high end. That said, if you're not using an RTX 2080 Ti at 1080p with ray tracing disabled, what does Ryzen have to offer? Okay, so here's a comparison between the Ryzen 7 2700X and Core i9 9900K. At the top of the graph, we see the previous RTX 2080 Ti results at 1080p, and here we see the Intel CPU offered a 16% performance boost for the average frame rate, and 18% for the 1% low result. So a decent performance advantage offered by Intel here. Switching to the RTX 2080 didn't change too much. Uh, here we're still mostly CPU bound at 1080p. The 9900K was 11% faster for the average frame rate and 15% faster for the frame time result. So for those of you seeking maximum performance at 1080p, the 9900K seems like the way to go. However, if you're using a more mid-range GPU, like the RTX 2070, so a $500 GPU, then it appears you'll receive a similar level of performance with either the 2700X or 9900K. Here the Intel CPU was just 2% faster for the average frame rate and 5% faster for the 1% low, which is a negligible difference. 
That being the case, using any GPU that's slower than an RTX 2070, I will see no difference between these two CPUs at 1080p using ultra quality settings. And we see that to be the case with the GTX 1070. But what if you want a game at 1440p and that resolution uh, certainly seems more fitting for the four GPUs tested here. Well, at 1440p, we see very little difference between the 2700X and 9900K using the GTX 1070, RTX 2070, and even the RTX 2080. The 9900K still offered a superior gaming experience at 1440p when using the RTX 2080 Ti. Here it was 13% faster on average with a 21% greater frame time result. Still, for most gamers, spending twice as much on the 9900K uh, seems like a poor investment. Now, assuming you actually purchased that 2080 Ti for 4K gaming, it appears the choice of CPU doesn't really matter that much here, at least when comparing high-end AMD and Intel models. Even with the RTX 2080 Ti, both CPUs enabled the same level of performance, hitting around 80 FPS on average, with a 1% low of 65 FPS. Ideally, I would have liked to have done more testing for this video, uh, but due to the ridiculous amount of time it does take, uh, to conduct these multiplayer tests and the fact that I only have, well, I have a couple of accounts, but you are limited after five hardware changes on an Origin account. So you change a graphics card or a CPU five times or even disable something like hyperthreading or whatever to test certain things out that will constitute as a hardware change. So even though I've got a few accounts, I was pretty much maxing them out every day that I was able to test with this. And then you gotta wait 24 hours before you can do any more testing, very annoying it wastes a lot of my time, it's very inefficient. Anyway, despite all that, I will continue to benchmark other CPUs upon request. So if there is a CPU you'd like to see added to this list, I will do my best to make that happen. I'm also going to look at doing, uh, look at including different test conditions. So perhaps different maps and modes and things like that. Because testing with Battlefield 5 for CPUs is quite interesting, I think. But anyway, I think this is a pretty good starting point and we have some pretty good data here anyway. The game is playable on quad cores, but you can expect frequent frame dips resulting in less consistent frame rates. For the most part, we've found that the older Core i5-7600K has been hanging in there pretty well with AAA titles released in 2018. But for the multiplayer portion of Battlefield 5, you will want to avoid the big 64 player battles. This also means for smooth, consistent gameplay, the Core i3 range along with the quad-core Ryzen CPUs are pretty much a write-off. Of course, if you're willing to accept regular stuttering and dips below 60 FPS, then you can still make do with these processes. Now, if I was building a PC just to play Battlefield 5 at the highest possible frame rates with absolutely nothing else in mind, I'd probably get a Core i5-8600K but for just $10 less than the Ryzen 7 2700, you'd really have to be doing nothing other than playing Battlefield 5, and you'd have to be completely ignoring future upgrade options. For any concerned AMD fans, I would like to just point out that the Ryzen 7 2700 also comes with a cooler, and yes, I agree that overall it is much better value. But for just playing Battlefield 5 on a high refresh rate display, the 8600K can offer a better experience. Of course, if you're gaming with an RTX 2070 or slower using the ultra quality settings, then it doesn't really matter. And in my opinion, you're better off getting a Ryzen processor as they are better value, especially at the lower end. Alternatively though, if you're willing to drop the quality settings down to higher, even medium for maximum frame rates, then you'll start to see a benefit from going with the higher clocked, lower latency Intel CPU. Also, keep in mind that both AMD and Intel CPUs can be overclocked for greater performance and things like memory timings can be manually tuned and this is beneficial for both platforms. Generally speaking, AMD does better with memory tuning while Intel gains more from core overclocking. That being the case, it would be possible to push the Ryzen 7 2700X more into GPU limited territory with some memory tuning, but as always with overclocking, your mileage will vary. Overall, I'd say while the Ryzen results look a bit disappointing at 1080p with extreme high-end GPUs, given the clock speed deficit, the fact that the 2700X is just 15% slower than the 9900K is actually rather impressive. And well, that is going to do it for this one. If you did enjoy the video, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe for more content, and if you appreciate the work we do at Horrorbox, then consider supporting us on Patreon. You will gain access to our Discord chat, monthly live streams, and our behind the scenes videos. Anyway, thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.